Alrighty, this week I could not get a guest, so uh, as promised, I will be doing a solo pod. If you're interested, great. If you're not, no problem. If this video tanks, I don't care. This is not the first time a video would tank, and it definitely won't be the last. So what I want to talk about, a little bit about myself, and then we'll jump into some topics that I think are going to be useful to more, more and more people. So what I have lined up for some topics, and if you're listening to this in audio, it'll probably be like divided into segments, um, just so I don't have to do all of this in one take, one 45 minute take, which would be brutal. But anyways, the topics I have are how I became a top 2000, top 3000 StarCraft 2 player in the world at one point, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about my you know love for the RTS genre. I'll talk about how I got Steep and the pod. I think I said that on the actual Stipe pod, but for the people that have missed that story, no problem, I'll tell again, you can skip it if you already know it. How to make viral videos, I have made a decent amount of content that has been seen by, you know, hundreds and millions of people, so I think I can give some insight to that. Um, maybe I'll include, if you're watching this on YouTube, maybe I'll include, like, pictures and stuff to make it somewhat more watchable, instead of you having to look at my ugly face for 45 minutes. I will talk about, you know, freelancing, you know, how to change careers, if that's something that you might be interested in. I think that's something I can offer wisdom on. Um, I'll talk about why I've stopped uploading on my main channel. Um, I'll talk about why I'm moving to Spain, or why I'm trying to move to Spain, hopefully within the month. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about, you know, why engineering jobs suck, and my, you know, plans for the future, my plans for future guests, and what the real goal of this podcast is, why, why I've even started making this podcast, how I, how I make the podcast, just a little more insight on the podcast itself. So, a bit more about myself, my name is Nenad, or Nelly, if, you know, depends who you are and how you want to call me, I don't care, either name is fine. I started making YouTube videos in around 2006, or at around 2006, when I just got a new engineering job that I really was not excited about and the money was great but the job itself really sucked it was soul crushingly boring and it really gave me no place to you know be creative so i used youtube as an avenue to kind of have a different sense of fulfillment because you know engineering work in general is pretty soul crushing so i started making random videos and it was about fifa content because that's what i kind of knew pretty well at the time. I started playing FIFA around 2013, so by 2016 I was really good at the game. I'm like, well, I can make content, like half the stuff is garbage. So I started making my own garbage, and then it transitioned into all sorts of content. I, I've made every kind of video you can think of. I love the idea of making content. I love a challenge. I love a place where I can actually explore my, my own creativity, where I don't get that in engineering. And a bit about myself, um, we moved to Canada when I was around seven, so around 2002. Um, Serbia was struggling economically, it was not really um, a place where my parents saw there was a lot of future. Uh, this was after NATO as well, during the bombings, that's kind of, for us, was the, I guess, let's say, tip of the iceberg where we tried everything to, to not live through that and not go through that again. So my parents applied for a visa, and lucky enough, they got one. Um, it was around the time my dad actually was supposed to get a job in Germany, and he you know, turned down that money and a really good job. So we moved to Canada, and my parents sacrificed a lot for me to get here. So I, that's for me, has always been the driving motivation to, to not be a fuck-up, <laughs> to not be a failure. Um... So I owe, I owe them a lot, and uh, my, my gaming background, if you want to call it that, comes from um, probably my dad, who has, who has a computer science degree, and we were one of the first people in our little city of like 50,000 people, um, Samska Mitrovica, which is um, Sirmium. It was actually one of the biggest Roman cities back in, back in the old days, um, and there's Roman remains everywhere. So he has a computer science degree. He was one of the first people to get a computer, and I was one of the first kids in the city to actually be able to play any video games at all. Like, So I was playing like Mortal Kombat, I was playing, I think, Age of Empires at the time, I was playing Warcraft 1, like all these games, and everyone came over to my house and watched me play, They're like, oh my god, like, they thought, like, you know, I had a spaceship in my house, so, <laughs> so there was a few, you know, good years, let's say, in my childhood, uh, where Serbia was doing well, we were doing well, my, my dad's business was doing well, and then it gradually got, you know, progressively worse, until eventually we just decided, hey, we've had enough of this, let's restart, and we basically came here with not much, I lived with my cousin for the first couple months, 
and that's where I started playing like StarCraft 1 online. This is the first time I started playing online games. Um, he's already lived here for many years, so he was established. We lived in his basement for the first like six months until we finally got our own place. Uh, my mom worked multiple jobs, multiple jobs out of her own discipline because she couldn't find work in her discipline because she didn't speak English, same thing with my dad. So they sacrificed a lot in their own careers for me and my brother to succeed here in Canada. So the move to Canada when I was seven was actually really, really rough for me. Um, I did not want to learn how to speak English. Um, we actually had classes in Serbia and uh, I remember just thinking, well, I'm not gonna need this. <laughs> Why would I need English? That's so useless. And uh, I never really got around to learning it when I was there, I never really cared for it. And then when I got here at seven years old, I was like, ugh, I really wish I kind of <laughs> tried with English. So the first year here, I hated it. You know, we moved from all my friends, my childhood, everything kind of vanished. And I really resented being here for, for a year. And that probably made me like a little bit of a brat. Um, and I didn't even go to school for the first year because I just didn't want to go. I was just always crying, always complaining, always saying no. And then eventually, you know, as I, you know, started learning English, as I started getting friends here, I settled in. And uh, this has been, Windsor, Ontario has been my home for over 20 years now, which is actually a crazy thing to even think about. And I've, for the most part, I've enjoyed living here. I, I make my, my complain about Windsor. I might have like Windsor memes and stuff, but in reality, it, like 95% of the time, it's been pretty good. And it's also been considerably better from what we came from. And um, I'm extremely grateful for the, for the move. I think it's the best thing my parents could have done for, you know, for myself and my brother. And, um, yeah. All right, that's a bit about myself. I feel like you guys know me an okay amount now. Let's talk about some of the more juicier, spicier topics. Yes, um, the main thing I started doing was making YouTube videos in 2016. Even though I had an engineering degree, I didn't find as much fulfillment in my engineering job. It was just a salary in my eyes. And YouTube was always a place where like, oh, I can, I can be funny. I can do other things. I can try to be creative. I can make my own videos. And at the start, it was really bad content. It was horrendous. Like I had my own series, FIFA series. It was just so brutal to watch. I look back at those videos and say, it's so brutal to watch. My heart was in the right place, but like I had no on-screen presence. Like it, it, there was no flow to any videos. There was no like creativity in edits. There was no like funny jokes, punchlines. There was nothing, nothing. But over time, the videos got, you know, better as I got better, obviously. And my first big content, let's say, that kind of took off was I started making these random um, YouTube compilation videos, um, like FIFA videos, but like I would add my own commentary and I put them up on Reddit. This was before self-promotion was, you know, frowned upon. Like, like the worst thing you can do besides murder a person is self-promote on Reddit. And uh, that's when my channel got the first couple hundred subscribers, maybe, maybe even a thousand at one point. And then I continued to make FIFA content and the big break, I guess, for me was I did a collab video with Spencer FC. We played two versus two, me and my ex versus him and his, his girlfriend at the time. Um, so that was, let's say the big break, but I don't, there's really no more big breaks on YouTube. It doesn't exist anymore. You need to be constantly making quality content. One viral video means almost nothing at this point. I have several vi viral videos and I can't still crack through the consistent, like, you know, there's a few ways to, to imagine success on YouTube. And the way I look at it is there's the, you know, you just got a big video. That's it. You know, you can't do that again that was just a one-off lucky thing, which even that itself is, I think, pretty impressive. But then there's people that can upload consistently in the same topic, same niche, same genre, and they would consistently get views. That's another level of success. And then there's like some people that can literally upload anything and people watch it because they just love that person or love their personality. And to me, that's the ultimate form. If I can get to a place where I can just upload freely, whatever the hell I want. And in a way, the podcast is that I'm uploading with random guests every week. Um, and for the most part, I'm pretty happy with the way that's going. Um, but YouTube itself is just, it's just so brutal. It's so difficult. It's, it, and it might sound, um, kind of funny coming from someone that has an electrical engineering degree. And that was a brutal within itself, but that was a different kind of mechanical, let's say toughness, because like, I know exactly what I have to do and what I have to achieve to get to that, let's say next level to get the job, whatever. But with YouTube, there's no secret sauce. Like there's no secret formula. There's no like pattern to follow for the most part, unless you already know what that is and you've done it before. Um, you can't just go into a, you know, a grinder and come out at the end of it with, with this goal that you've achieved. 
So for me, YouTube content has always been a place where I thought, hey, I'm gonna love making videos. I, that's what I wanna do. Whether it's successful or not is not relevant to me. If it is beautiful, I'm really happy, but I would never put that that much pressure on myself to succeed in YouTube. So um, I don't even know what the hell I was talking about anymore, to be honest. <laughs> We're talking about YouTube startups, yeah. So the main channel was doing really well. I started getting a few hundred, few thousand followers. Uh, I was enjoying FIFA as a video game. We started doing a podcast. We had the number one FIFA podcast on the planet at one point, me and two of my friends. And gradually what ended up happening is the game just became more and more horrendous. It became more and more unplayable. Um, the community is also extremely toxic. There's just so many things wrong with FIFA. It's almost like trying to fix like politics. It's just so, it's such a deep embedded problem. It's, it's rotten to its very core that I think it honestly might be easier to solve like polit political problems or like pollution than it is to solve FIFA because FIFA is in just such a horrendous place in so many different ways. And I cannot see anything changing in the next, I don't know, let's say five years. And that's kind of why I stepped away from making these videos. I've always said in my videos, I was just doing it to have some sort of presence so I can still stay alive, stay afloat and continue to make content on YouTube, have an audience. Um, but I knew that it was just like a, a, a band-aid on a gunshot wound. It wasn't going to hold up forever. And I've always said, if my podcast does really well, why the hell would I keep making FIFA content when I don't enjoy it? I will just transition into something that I do enjoy. Um, but I don't regret making FIFA content. If I go back and I make, let's say down the road, I make like some random videos. I'm still going to, I still enjoy doing it. I want to make a FIFA review. I want to make some pest reviews, let's say. And it doesn't really matter what happens with the success of those videos. I don't care. I like making content that will always remain. Um, but currently I am really enjoying the podcast. I'm really enjoying having all these different, I've talked to so many cool people and it's, I'm extremely grateful for anyone that's come on the podcast and had a conversation with me and I hope to get more and more people. And it seems like people are enjoying the podcast a lot. So I, I have a, a success and something I enjoy and that's more than enough for me to continue pursuing it and drop something I don't like. I would never continue to do something that I don't like for a prolonged period of time unless I absolutely have nothing else. Anytime I've really hated something, I've really begun to hate it, I've always tried to find a way out and that, I guess we can transition into engineering from that. Okay, let's talk about engineering. There is a lot to discuss here. When I was a young buck and I didn't know what to do with my life, my brother already had an engineering degree. Uh, I picked a career based on kind of like a process of elimination. I know a lot of people do this in such a terrible way to pick a career. I would not recommend it to anyone. If you don't know what you want to do, take some time and really evaluate what you want to do. And the way you can do that is by traveling. It's by exploring different options. Don't just do a process of elimination. I think school can still overall be beneficial to your experience just for, you know, going to school, um, you know, getting that academic kind of structure. If you need it, it might be beneficial. But if you're desired career or if you're what you love is not really tied to a degree then don't pursue it that's my opinion you can disagree if you like uh, if you want to be a doctor of course you're, you know you're gonna need to go to school if you want to be a digital marketing wizard you don't need to be in school for that the best thing you can do for that is like start doing your own content and build up a portfolio of your own accolades and then present that to a company because realistically a lot of companies will not care about a degree a thousand kids will come out of a university every year with a degree but only a few of them will come out with a degree and then let's say i don't know their own proof of success hey i have grown a following or hey i know how to market myself or hey i know how to create this thing so anyways engineering four years pretty rough i'm not gonna lie i sacrificed a lot of my social life my marks were not amazing probably because i wasn't as passionate about this thing and as soon as i got out of it I would say about three, maybe three months after I got out of the degree, I took a small break, maybe a month. I traveled a little bit to uh, China, to Japan, Thailand. I've been all over the places in the world. I've been to so many different countries, maybe like 20, 30 countries, but I took some time off and then immediately after I got a automotive engineering job, which on the scale of, let's say engineering jobs, like best to worst engineering jobs, I would say automotive is probably on the like worst end of that spectrum. And Obviously, I didn't know this at the time, but at 23 years old, when they offered me almost six figures starting, I thought, oh my God, the dream. I made it. <laughs> I did it. I beat the video game at 23. And reality is the video game just started. I got the job and I was just miserable. I absolutely hated it. Um, I was I live in Canada, but I worked in the States because they pay a much better, better salary. So that job paid 
100k but there's so many different little things there that you don't think about you, you think about the money and you get tied up so much in it you don't realize what the actual importance is do you enjoy what you're doing eight hours a day because if you don't eventually that will wear you down and no amount of money is going to fix those problems i can promise you that so you work 40 hours a week let's say starting my commute to work was about an hour there and an hour back on a, on a good day. On a bad day, it could be anywhere between hour 15 one way and hour 15 back. So that already, that's already 10 hours plus a week added on to that 40 hours. That commute is brutal. If you live in Canada, six months of the year, it's unbearably cold here. So waking up at seven in the morning, pitch dark, driving to a job you don't hate, walking in minus 20 weather, Maybe that, maybe I'm spoiled. Maybe I, maybe I'm not, no, I'm definitely not spoiled, but I'm, maybe I do, don't have a good enough perspective here, but I can assure you 90% of people would break under those conditions if they really didn't like what they were doing. So I started doing this job on paper. My life was great. I had a girlfriend. I had a good income, um, stability, let's say, if you want to call it for this job, but mentally I was just miserable. I was in such a horrible place because to me, I focus so much on what this, this is going to become. This is like a 30 year thing, like doing this for 30 years. I was going to, I was going to blow my brains out if I had to do this. I go into a cubicle with thousands of other people that I don't know. And, uh, literally the first like day of work, this place is enormous. This is one of the biggest facilities, engineering facilities on the planet. It's one of the biggest in America for sure. You can look and see cubicles like as far as your eye can see until your eye cannot see anymore. You can see cubicles. If you have cubicle fever or whatever, cubicle phobia, it's the first day there is a rough awakening. So I started that job with um, lots of high hopes, lots of big dreams, like, oh, I'm going to do stuff that's meaningful. And for the first couple of months, it wasn't too bad. Like I was kind of enjoying the challenge. Uh, I wasn't enjoying the schedule, but I was enjoying the challenge of kind of learning these new things. And then about three months in my manager who was like, you know, helping me with everything, teaching me everything I needed to know, gets moved to another division. And all of a sudden I'm stranded on an island where I don't have many people I can talk to. Uh, the work is not always coming in. So like engineering in the early stages, you have these periods where you don't get much work because one, they don't trust you. Two, it takes time to teach you. So they will ignore, ignore you because you're kind of the last option. Instead of investing time to teach you, they would rather kind of just do it themselves and then you're left sitting there like, what the hell do I do with my life? And I know this is a lot of engineering jobs at the start. Maybe this is a lot of jobs to begin with, but that's not even true because this job that I currently have, yeah, that's not true. So I know engineering jobs for sure. There's this little, you know, grace period, let's say, where you're just kind of doing nothing and you're just waiting for work to come in and you can usually finish your work well beyond, um, well before your time is up. So you're left just in this cubicle for eight hours a day with like, let's say five hours of work. And the other time you're just pondering existence. Like what the hell? It's like a prison sentence, but I get paid, I guess. Maybe some people like that. For me, it was torture because I always need to be doing something. I always need to feel fulfilled. And I absolutely hated it. Then the next person I got assigned to be my like helper, she got pregnant. That's our man, our, our supervisor. And she had to take a maternity leave. So now I really have no one to ask and I, I'm getting work that I don't understand and I have no one to ask. And I just, it was just stress was killing me of like either being behind because I don't know what to do or not have having anything to do. And I could not find a way around this problem. It was literally eating up my brain. Like I was, I super unhappy with what I was doing. I didn't care about the money. Money at that point was so irrelevant. I didn't, it didn't make me any happier seeing a, you know, paycheck every week in my, my bank account and then having to go back and work 40 hours and drive 10 hours to work and all that so, this other stuff. So the money didn't solve the problems. So I flat out just quit that job. No plans, no, like no real idea what the hell I'm going to do. And, um, people think I, I thought I was going to do YouTube full time. Not really true. I, YouTube was the only thing I was doing. And I was like, I'll just do that. I guess until I figure out what the hell I want to do. But I honestly, for a year, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was so disappointed with the amount of time I invested in this field. And like, this is what it became that I just resented it so much. I'm like, did I really just lose four years for this? Like it, it, it felt like I was just starting all over again. You know, I said, I, f I felt like I thought I beat the video game. It literally felt like it was one of those games that you have to beat on the first, like with one life. And if you don't, you start all the way at the beginning. That's what it felt like. So after a year, um, it just, I needed to do something else. So I found another engineering job 
and this was a lot better. This job was a job I actually enjoyed a decent amount. I was working with people I liked, but once again, I kind of saw where it was going. The more responsibility you get, the more stress the job is, and an, an automotive is such a high pace, stress induced field. And the people that I saw that were like, let's say five years ahead of me, that I like, this is what I'm going to be in five years. They were working like 60 hours a week, commuting to work every day for an hour. I think the average commute in America is like 45 minutes one way, which is absolutely insane. Um, they didn't have many holidays. It, you know, they, they made a hundred, probably 120,000 a year, but it, they just looked miserable. I'm like, is this what I'm working towards? Is this, is this the end goal? Is this making it? So I enjoyed the people. The job was okay, but ultimately I kind of see engineering as like, I don't think it's the right field for me. And maybe if you, if you are someone that really enjoys engineering, like let's say from 19 and you're positive, this is the right path. I honestly wish you nothing the best, nothing but the best. I think you're blessed. You're in a blessed position because if it's that easy and if you're that sure, then pursue it, then go for it. You're going to, you're so fortunate that you found something that you like that early on and you didn't have this in between period where you lost time. Let's say like, I think I think I lost time, but I think it had to have happened that way for me. Um, so if you do like it, I'm not knocking engineering in general, if that's something you enjoy. I just know a lot of people that do it just simply for the money and they're always thinking about how the hell to get out of it and they just don't have that key. They don't have that solution because they haven't really explored the options too well. So they end up getting like really content, contempt, content, I don't know. They get really like the stagnant and they don't start finding this exit plan and next thing you know you know your best years of your life start going behind you and you realize you have this deep regret of not trying anything else and then you're told to to do something else or that's what you think at least and then you're just kind of stuck in this miserable loop of making money but being unhappy and then you buy stuff that you think is going to make you happy none of that stuff fixes your problems and it's just, it's really unfortunate. So after that second job, it was it was solid. I was trying to renew my contract, but the company was looking to go in a different direction with our department and I need to find another job. And I was looking to figure out like, do I wanna live in Michigan? Do I wanna move and do this engineering job uh, or do some other engineering job? And honestly, it was a temporary solution to a permanent problem. I was just unhappy with being here in general and the weather and you know, there's a lot like, you know, when you know everyone in your own city, it's kind of like, the drama and all that kind of stuff. I, I just, I hate get, getting involved in that kind of stuff in my own little city and I kind of need a change of scenery. So instead of getting a place in Michigan, I started looking at other options. I started looking at ways to get the hell out of here. So, um, September, no, December, 2019, was it December, 2019, right before the pandemic, I traveled to Spain and I traveled to Italy and I did those trips just because I wanted to see the universities. I had, I'd been looking at universities in Italy and Spain, and I wanted to see what these places were like to live in. Um, so I would get a change of scenery and you know, I'll go do a school, two years of school there and see if I like it. And then I'll find, I'll figure out the solution after that. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about the money. I wasn't worried about losing a secure job. I always thought like, whatever, it's engineering. I can find a job the next day if I really wanted to. I've never been worried about getting another engineering job there's a thousand different engineering jobs so the security for me was already kind of in place i had a little bit of savings and i just wanted to try something else so i applied to a bunch of different places and ultimately when i got to spain i fucking i love spain it was just so calm and peaceful and the weather was nice and the food was good the people were it was just i've traveled like i said to many places um let's let's just go through some of them jamaica uh cuba dominican uh iceland germany uh italy spain thailand china japan um i'm sure i'm missing a bunch but i've traveled to so many different places in the world greece serbia obviously um bosnia uh montenegro um there's a bunch of other places i probably missed and to me, Spain kind of just felt like home. It felt like it was the right place to be. Now, whether that's going to be the case when I move there, if I still enjoy it that much, to be seen. But it gave me at least like, okay, I know where the next move is going to be. So I decided to enroll in a master's degree in Spain. I started doing that. I was hoping to move last summer and then a pandemic happened and my school got moved entirely to online. And it was funny because I actually flat out quit my other job that I got like nine months in. And everyone was shocked. I was like, I was planning to do this the whole time, bro. Like, I, did, I had no plan of, like, working here. Like, I don't want to do this. It was a different engineering <clears throat> job that paid really well. And I went into it knowing exactly what it was this time. I wasn't, 
you know, like the young kid, I was expecting something different. I knew exactly what this job was. I just wanted to use it to save some money to, you know, have some savings. And then I would try to move to Spain in the following summer and pursue a master's. And then after that, I would figure out how to get a job there, whether in the automotive field, I was hoping to get out of the automotive engineering field and go into a different kind of engineering, I don't know, renewable energy or something that was somewhat less stressful and maybe like more chill. And, and I was I was willing to take a massive pay cut because that's what you have to do if you're moving from North America to Europe and all these things. I was willing to sacrifice all those things for a possibility at like, you know, be better weather, um, better like social life, um, more vacation, stuff like that. So to me, that was a well worthy trade. And then a year after, let's say, after that idea, after the move to Spain had manifested, I was already, I finished my first semester of university online. I finished my second semester and this master's to me has been an absolute waste of time. Uh, I, the problem, the thing is that like, I've already had engineering jobs where some of these young bucks have not. So I knew exactly what we were learning in school was not applicable to like 90% of the jobs. Like I already knew that going, like the moment the courses started, the semester started, I'm like, oh my God, there's so much garbage here that like, it's so not worth it. But the degree was cheap and it was just more of a degree to get a visa. So about, let's say three months ago, I started looking at the possibility of getting some part-time work while I'm in Spain, let's say. So I was like, it's gonna be hard to find part-time work while I'm, you know, so it's going to be hard to find part-time engineering work in general. So I started looking, and this is kind of, this is where the uh, switching career paths and freelancing, this is the, the topic at discussion now. Um, I started looking at like, what can I do with my YouTube background? Because at this point I already had three plus million views on YouTube. I've made a bunch of viral videos. I know how to for edit videos, I know how to edit audio, I know how to market videos, I know how to do search engine optimization, I know how to host, and I know I'm pretty solid in front of a camera, I'd like to think at this point, um, I'm like, can I get a job in this kind of field, like, is that like a, maybe it's a solid temporary work idea, 20 hours a week, something, just to continue making some money on the side while I'm in school, and funny enough, I made a profile on AngelList, and I might use some images here to show you guys, and I got more interviews and more callbacks from these random companies on AngelList than I did with a with an engineering degree and three years of experience. I had zero marketing experience. I had zero formal education in this field, and yet I was getting interviews left and right. And the the money they were paying was like pretty good. Like it was slightly less than my engineering salary, which is kind of insane. And Eventually, I just settled on one of these jobs. I, you know, I make content for one of these one of these companies, and uh, my salary is maybe like let's say ten percent, fifteen percent less than my engineering job. But I work fully remote. I can work exactly when I want to work. I can clock in the amount of hours I want. Um, I can take vacation, whatever I want. Like the benefits that I got from this um, outweigh all the money lost from engineering. There's no stress in this job. There's no like, th there is difficulty, but it's not like not like overwhelmingly or I have to go to like to 10 different people. There's no massive bureaucracy where there is with big automotive companies. It's like 10, 15 people in this company. I know who to ask. I know what I need to do. It's it's perfect. Honestly, I, I'm beyond lucky, beyond grateful that I got this job, but I'm also not like worried that I can't land another one of these jobs, which is why I think I can safely say that I've switched career paths um, just based on the opportunities that I got. Now that once I have this job and once I actually have formal um, experience in this field, it's going to be even easier to find the next one. And now the ability to work remote and let's say make a US salary while living in Europe is better than having an engineering job in Europe because it's going to pay you a lot more than an engineering job in Europe. It's going to give you way more freedom and way more flexibility. And I don't know, the benefits of this outweigh everything engineering had to offer. So that extra, let's say 10, 20, 30, 40, even if it's 40K, mo money has been money doesn't make me happy. And I've realized that at a very young age, maybe, maybe very fortunately, I've realized that some people waste a lot of time chasing that money and, and realizing that really wasn't the root of their happiness or that wasn't going to solve any of their problems. What makes me happy is being with my family and friends, um, having more vacation time, working less. Um, that doesn't mean I don't like to work hard. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm lazy. It just means like, I know what fulfills me. I know I'm, what I'm actually chasing is not this bottomless pit, which is kind of money. I, I enjoy chasing my activity as I enjoy hobbies. I'm learning another language. You know, I, I like doing these things that are going to self-improve me as opposed to 
buy me new things. Those, those things I've tried, they don't make me happy. If they do for you, great. But for me, it never worked. And that kind of leads me into my next section, which I want to help people that also want to have a similar route. Maybe maybe I can give you some first general advice in, in how to do this. And then I can tell you how I did my own specific route. Um, so general advice, if you want to do something else, or if you want to try something else, you're gonna have to do it on the side. Um, most people don't have enough to live and just explore whatever the hell they want to do until they decide that one magical thing is it's going to be a lot of work like YouTube and work was a lot of YouTube and having an engineering job was a lot of work. I was working like on my own job, let's say 50 hours a week, if you include the commute. And then I was working on like my own side hustle for like 10, 15, 20, 30 hours a week until I got to a point where I was good at it and I could minimize my work. But you're going to need to find that secondary thing that you do and just chip away at it. Just add a little bit of time to it. Take extra courses if you need uh, a different kind of education. Great. But just chip away at it and be patient. It's going to happen. It just needs a lot of time and a lot of patience and a lot of self-belief. You got to believe that this is the right move for you. And even if it's not, that you're getting something out of it, some sort of other fulfillment. And now for like specifics of, let's say your career path switch to marketing, to video, to content, there are so many different ways to do it. You just have to have the desire and the real genuine passion to do it. So, um, okay, so some different ways, just start making your own videos, see how that goes. Don't worry necessarily about the views, worry about making quality content, something that you are proud of something that you took from nothing and turned into a video. That to me has always been the most amazing part. Taking something that literally was just a thing in your brain to a video that a thousand people saw or whatever, a certain amount of people saw and they could relate to it and they're like, wow, that was really well made. So you basically created that. You brought that into the world. And I always thought that was the most interesting part of content. If you are a fan of something, you can make like a Twitter page. I know for H3H3, um, there was some person that made a Twitter page. We just uploaded like memes and funny posts from the, from the podcasts and like random clever edits. And eventually that Twitter page got big enough where H3H3, Ethan, uh, reached out to this person and they became their like full-time social media person, editor, whatever you want to call it. So some people might look from the outside and, oh, why are you wasting all this time doing this? It's not really a waste of time if you enjoy it. That's not, you know what I mean? It's not, if you enjoy doing something, it's not a waste of time. And just because other people tell you it's a waste of time doesn't mean anything. People are full of shit. They will always pretend like they know what's best for you. And in reality, only you know what's best for you. You can take certain advice, obviously. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't let someone else tell you what is good and bad and what you, what you enjoy, right? You can make that decision on your own when you try it. So that's one way you can start a service on like Fiverr or one of these websites where you offer really cheap video editing or thumbnail making. I know a bunch of people make hundreds, thousands of dollars on like just making thumbnails and emotes for Twitch people. So if you have some sort of artistic ability, that's a beautiful place to go and show that off. And eventually as you get better and better, you can make more and more and then other opportunities will present themselves. And if you want, you can take that, those accolades and then go to a company and say, Hey, I look at all the stuff I know how to do. I have proven success. I've actually even been paid for this stuff. I have paid, um, work that I've put out into the world. And then that can be your resume. The real big key for me to actually switching career paths was not actually developing these secondary, let's say skills, these accolades in the field where I don't have formal education. The big breakthrough, let's say was just my ability to figure out, Oh, wait a minute. I have all the skills that you're asking for. I just need to market myself better and explain why I can do the same thing I did for me for you. So my big breakthrough was not actually obtaining these skills. Yeah. It was really hard to make viral videos. It was really hard to have the success that let's say I had and it's my success is like let's say I don't know it's not that significant in the grand scheme of things there's plenty of people that go on to have be you know make much more successful channels and whatever bigger videos but to me what I've already done on YouTube has surpassed my my wildest dreams to have several vir viral videos and um just videos that I'm super proud of out there um it, to me I've already succeeded anything beyond this point is overtime it's bonus money um whatever you want to call it I'm delighted with that. But as soon as I figured out how to market myself, I was able to go to companies and my, let's say proposals, my cover letters, it was never anything fancy. It was always straight to the point. I looked at what they needed and I just simply said, I have what you need and I have the success to prove it. Uh, let's, let's chat or whatever. It was something along those lines. I didn't waste any time. I don't have time to write a thousand crazy cover letters like I did for engineering, which was pure nonsense. I have like hundreds of 
various cover letters. Oh, I think I'm a great employee because I, you know, was really good in my high school chess team. I don't, like, whatever. Who cares? No one cares. <laughs> no one cares, bro. Um, it's much easier just to be flat. I'll be like, hey, you need this. I have this on my resume and I have actual proof. Here's my content. Go check that video out. I can make those kinds of videos for you. Bang, done. That's it. That's all they really care about. They also don't want to lose a lot of time. And that's how I landed my first job in the digital marketing space. And the possibilities here are really endless. You just have to find a way to figure out what your skills are, how you can market those. I mean, there's so many things that you might not even think about, but are actually valuable skills to companies. Like if you run your own social media and let's say you have a decent following, let's say you have a meme page with like 10,000 followers or something stupid. Let's say you're like the mod in a, in a, in a I don't know, discord. Believe it or not, there's companies that are looking for moderators, social media managers. They're looking for these kinds of people to help them with their business. And once you get in, you can do anything from that point on. Then you'll start getting experience and you'll start getting even more of an education in that field. So if you really want to do it, you can do it. You just have to definitively say, I'm doing this and then put the time in and just have self-belief that eventually it will pan out the way you want it to. Okay, so let's talk about these viral videos that I've made. I've made quite a few, I would say, popular videos. What really describes a viral video? Let's see, viral video definition. What is a, well, like definitively, what does a viral video mean? A viral video is a video that becomes popular through a viral, viral process of internet sharing, typically through um, sharing websites such as YouTube. Okay, <laughs> I'm in, baby, I'm in. So. My first big successes were the Reddit videos I posted. I posted like FIFA commentary videos, just me being a goof and making stupid commentary. Those got anywhere between 10 and 100,000 views. So it wasn't anything crazy. I had a few, um, well, actually, why don't I just go on my channel? I had a few different videos that did really randomly well. Like I had a how to not get blocked by Bateson, which was just like a random person in the community video. And then from that point on, I had other successful videos. I had a, a, dr a drone video which um it didn't get a, a lot of views on my channel like it got only like 10,000 views on my channel but like it got like 150,000 views on reddit and it was the front page of our fifa and i might have even gone to like the front page of reddit at one point so that was one of my bigger let's say successes but i've had all sorts of videos i've had a fortnite video where i made my own sound effects that was on the front page of the fortnite um reddit um, I had a bunch of videos that were picked up by Sports Bible. I had the drone video that was picked up by ESPN Brazil. Some guy wrote a massive like article in Portuguese. Um, I've had a video, my, my FIFA job is a 42 minute documentary on why FIFA is in the place that it kind of is right now. Um, I've had my random capture video. So I, when I was really uh, fed up with FIFA content about three years ago, I decided to make my first non FIFA video on my FIFA channel. And it got front page of our videos. Not even front page. It was the top of our our videos. It had like 60,000 upvotes. And it got like half a million views in a day. So that was my other viral video. Um, that was just, I would say that one was a little bit lucky. I just kind of made a goofy video about captchas. Highly relatable. Didn't even think about it. But yeah, I guess what was my point? The, am I flexing? Is that what I was trying to do here? No, I was trying to help you how to create your own viral video. So there's a few different ways you can do this. The easiest, let's say the easiest uh, intellectually, the easiest create creatively is effort. If you put effort into a video and I, if you do something tedious, let's say you can usually like that will usually be rewarded. If you can post that even on maybe not Reddit as much, but even, even Reddit has like certain loopholes where you can kind of post content. If you put a lot of effort into something, and I'm talking hours and hours of let's say editing or clever cuts or you make a massive compilation that will always be really well. If you take someone else's content, so you don't you don't have, let's say, the creativity to come up with some brilliant, hilarious, uh, you know, uh, creative uh, video, you can put effort in. If you made a compilation, I don't know, I can think of like 10 off the top of my head. If you made a doubt, the Age of Empires player, if you made a compilation of all the times he's lost a villager to a boar, and let's say that would take you a lot of time, yes. But if it was like a 10 minute video and just funny moments where he loses a villager, 100%, that video takes off. That video will get, I don't know, let's say 100,000 views. Like I'm, I, I can promise you that like with like 98% certainty because first of all, it's a video that not a lot of people are, would do. It's, it's very time intensive. People that are fans of doubt would find it and share the shit out of it. So that's 
I mean, that's a lock for so those kinds of videos. So effort, 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 effort. If you really don't have the creativity, you can ov- 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 you can always overcome creativity with effort, I think, especially with content. Another way is to try to find relatable videos. You can try to make something like the capture video, which is highly relatable um, in a form, in a, in a way that's almost like trying to be like a stand-up. You're trying to really tap in to the mindset of a community, of an audience, and try to find something that's really relatable, which makes it really shareable, and then the you know views are gradual. Another way you can make a, a viral video is to make a highly searched video, a video that solves a problem. Um, one of my more popular videos was just kind of a joke. It was like a Fortnite account lock situation, and it wasn't even a how-to video. It was just me trolling, and that video has like over 100,000 views. It's such a horrible video, and <laughs> it's been uh, dislike bombed, rightfully so, but if you can find a searchable video to make to solve a problem, that will be that's probably the easiest route I would say to getting views on YouTube. You might not necessarily go viral, but you're almost guaranteed to get a certain amount of people coming in and checking out that video. And lastly, I would say the biggest hardest one is to have a creative groundbreaking video. If you can have let's say a combination of these of these things, you can make a really awesome video. If you had like a video that was a lot of effort and it was super creative and it also solved the problem you've hit like the home run that video is going to do really well i think and um i don't know to me those are like the the three let's say big forms types of success and on youtube for example the biggest thing that you can do is make a quality thumbnail making sure that someone will actually click on the video is like 90 percent of the battle on youtube so if you can combine all these different things i said into one I'm almost guaranteeing you that you'll have a successful video, whether it goes viral, uh, you know, right away, or if it, you know, gets to like, let's say five years from now, it gets like a million views. That depends on the video, the niche, whatever, all that stuff. But I think that's probably your best bet if you want to make quality, popular videos. But I would go into it with a different mindset. I would go into it with, I want to make a video that I'm proud of. And then if those other things happen, you can kind of plan towards those things. Try to manifest those other goals into that but the main focus is to make something that you're really happy with and something that you enjoy doing okay i think i've got a lot of the things covered let's see i have a few different topics i've missed so how do i got steep on the pod how i became the top 2000 player in the world for starcraft and my plans for uh the podcast those are the big topics i've missed so let's jump into the steep a one steep a long story short pure luck but kind of hilarious i was on twitter i saw Steve Bay posted some random Modelo giveaway, and I'm like, whatever. I'll I ra- I rarely enter these giveaways, but I've seemed to have a decent amount of luck. I've won like a, a like an Xbox before on these giveaways. I've won like some Red Bull. I've won all these random things on giveaways. I'm like, whatever. I'll sign up for the Steve Bay Modelo giveaway. I didn't even read the rules. I didn't even read what the prize was. To be perfectly honest with you, and then a week later. I get an email from someone from Modelo. Hey, you've won this giveaway that was hosted by Stipe. I'm like, oh, sweet. Like, I'll get some Modelo. Hype. So I'm reading the email, blah, blah, blah. I go to the bottom, and it's like, oh, also, you will have a meet and greet with Stipe on this and this date. I'm like, what? A a meet and greet? Are you crazy? Amazing. I was like, who gives a shit about anything else that I've won? I get to talk with Stipe? This was unreal. This was I couldn't believe it. And funny enough, a few weeks before that, a few months before that, I had Stipe's um, protege, the, the young Serbian guy who was training at the gym, Alexa. Um, he was on my podcast. I just randomly emailed him and, and we were talking a lot about Stipe and, you know, all this stuff. And I didn't really want to ask him, you know, hey, bro, can can you get Stipe on the ball? Like, it just, like, it was a cunt move. Um, I would not feel good about it. But it's just funny. We talk a lot about Stipe and then all of a sudden, like a few weeks later, it just manifested that I would have this opportunity to talk with Stipe. So the day comes where I'm, you know, supposed to call in and I am, I am not relatively not nervous for any kind of content, any kind of podcast. I'm pretty like chill, pretty calm. I've done it a thousand times, but man, it's heavyweight champion of the world at times. Stipe, I was like, holy shit, this is unreal. And I was thinking, whatever, maybe I'll like call in and I'll be like one of 30 people that calls in and gets to ask like a question. And as I'm waiting in the chat room, my computer starts crashing. I almost fucking lost it. My computer starts crashing and I don't know why. I, 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 as Stipe is entering this, this chat, my computer freezes, like straight up locks. I'm like, 
Oh my god. I'm fucking spamming the, the restart button, trying to get back in it. And I'm like, this would just this would just be horrendous if this happened. I get back into the chat room and it's me, some random lady from Brooklyn, two dudes that work for Modelo, so they're not really part of the interview, and Stipe. That's it. <laughs> it's essentially three, four people in this room talking with Stipe for half an hour or whatever it was. And I wrote some questions. I want to ask like some clever, let's say, or maybe try to ask a question that he hasn't heard before to discuss something like, you know, maybe something that isn't too discussed. And uh, it was just unreal talking to Stevie. Such a nice guy. All those things they say, like about him being a really genuine guy. He really was. Immediately when we started talking, he like, oh, he's like, are you Serbian? Like, I noticed your name, your name and all this stuff. Uh, he was just super nice. And after the questionnaire, after the interview, whatever you want to call it, meet and greet, I asked them, the Modelo guy, I'm like, and this is not sponsored by Modelo. Um, I asked them, like, hey, man, um, is there any chance I can upload this, like, to the internet? Like, this was pretty cool. And he's like, yeah, of course, just, like, don't include uh, the other people, like, their faces, whatever. I'm like, no problem. So, like, I basically turned that into a mini pod with Stipe, and, and I couldn't be more delighted with how that came out. I hope one day the pod gets big enough. Uh, that I can actually, you know, reach out and be like, hey man, would you like to come back? Because I'm such a big fan of a lot of MMA guys. And I would love to even bring Alexa back. Um, so if he wants to do that, I, I'm open to having him anytime. Um, but yeah, it was, it was such an unreal experience for me. And I'm super happy. And I just, a little bit of luck in life sometimes with persistence. And that's how these things usually come about. I guess this can be a decent transition into what the future of the podcast is before I jump into the final topic, the StarCraft one. The future plan for the pod, honestly, I just want to keep inviting cool people. I don't really care what the discipline or what the thing is. I love so many different things in life and for such a long period of my life, people have told me, oh, you need to stick to one thing. You can only do one thing. Like the only way to succeed is to focus on one thing. And I've literally just not given a fuck to any of those comments in the past couple years. I'm doing what I want to do, how I want to do it. If you don't think there's a way for me to succeed in that, that's, that's not, that's not on me. I'm all find a way. And to know these, I know so many different things about so many different topics. It's actually been amazing for the podcast. I can bring literally any kind of guest because I have so many different things I love. That's why I can bring like comedians, UFC fighters, basketball players, soccer players, um, video game developers, esports players. It doesn't matter what the topic is. I'm fluent enough in it to have a, an interesting conversation. I take a lot of time and effort to make sure the podcast is quality. The behind the scenes, what I do is I research every guest. I watch a lot of their content. I make sure that if I'm inviting someone, if they're giving me an hour of their time, I respect that tremendously. And I want to make sure they see that in, first of all, my interest and then how informed I am about what they are and what they do. So if you're a fan of that person, I want to make sure that when you listen to a podcast, when I do, when I do with that person that you're like, Oh shit, this guy knew that too. I want to know everything that is within reason in, in that discipline for someone that's a fan to be excited and to also learn from that. And I hope just to pass on so much information to anyone that's looking for it. And my goal is to just keep pumping out information and from these different fields. It's from my podcast alone, I'm 25 episodes in, I've had like 20 different disciplines. And from every single one of these people, whether you're interested in the thing or not, you can learn something from it. It's, it's been an educational conversation. You can learn how this guy got to the MMA, how this guy became a fighter. You can learn how this guy became a video game developer or a comedian or how they took the route. And even if you maybe don't care about that yourself, you'll still find a knowledge in the conversation and it'll be enjoyable. But if you are a person that's looking for the actual specific knowledge, those podcasts are going to be like perfect for you. You're going to, you're going to fall in love with those. So I want to get more and more people. I'm constantly looking for a few different things. I'm looking for video game developers. There's a lot of guys whose video games I absolutely love and I would love to get them on the podcast. I've been looking for like Red Alert 1 video game designers. I've been looking for like Warcraft. Um, I've been looking for Heroes Mind Magic, all these random games. I want to talk to the guys and know what the journey was to make these games, the behind the scenes stuff, the things they didn't, you know, want to, or things they couldn't do, um, things they want to do, but they couldn't do all this little stuff Then I want to bring athletes on and learn about their lives and how they got to this, you know, crazy position and all that stuff. There's so much to me, that is the most beautiful part of the podcast. It's I, I personally enjoy it. I learn a lot. And then I hope to pass on that information to anyone that might find whether actual value in going the same route or entertainment in listening to these conversations.
And to answer the last question, which is kind of related to this, is why don't I want this to be an AOE podcast? My most successful guests are people from the AOE community, so wouldn't it make sense to go AOE? Well, I don't want to go down the same route I did with my FIFA channel, which is super niche, and I know that's how you succeed on YouTube. That's the easiest way to succeed on YouTube is to find a niche and just make content that curates that niche. What I'm trying to do is infinitely more difficult to have almost anything, any topic on my channel and hopefully it still does well. And short term, it's going to suck. Some videos are not going to do well. I'm fully aware of that. I've been in this game, this YouTube game for five, six years now. So I know kind of how this works. Short term, some videos are going to tank. Long term, I hope, you know, people will respect that I'm bringing so many different people on and and those videos that kind of tanked at the beginning will eventually get the recognition I feel they deserve. Like I've had a guy who had 190 million views on YouTube and he, he was literally one of the biggest YouTubers on the planet at one point. And his journey of like from the bottom to the top to kind of like the bottom again is so incredible. And I think it's, there's so much value in it. And that video has like 50 views to me. Like that's, that's laughable. I think it's criminally undervalued. Listen, and anyone that's even in the YouTube space would find that very interesting and super valuable. So I think I have self-belief that I'm producing quality. Uh, the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to take time before that quality I feel gets recognized. And I'm fully aware of that. If I was doing this for the quick and easy money, <laughs> I would have done a lot different things for that route. I know this is a massive investment and I'm enjoying every step of the way. And I'm fully, um, I'm fully okay with those videos not doing well um, short term and hopefully long term. I am get to a point where I can literally upload anything. I don't want to be cucked. I don't want to be, you know, tied down to any one discipline, any one job, any one thing. I want to have multiple options. That's the way my life has been for the past couple of years. And that's when I found the most enjoyment, most happiness, most satisfaction is when I've had the ability to say, hey, I like this. I'm going to do this. Hey, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. This is something that not very many people on this planet can do. So I am extremely happy with the route I've taken. All right, as we approach the hour mark, the final topic, which I would assume most of my AOE audience would be delighted about, which is how I became, and I have this screenshot. So I was rank 3,300 in the world in StarCraft during its prime, during Wings of Liberty, when this game had multiple, <laughs> multiple millions of players. And then in my North American region, I was top 1,430. To me, this is one of my greatest <laughs> accomplishments because for anyone that knows how difficult RTS games are and anyone that knows how many players that, that played StarCraft at such a high level to get to even this level, for even for even if it was for a day, if even if it was at this rank for a day, this is an incredible accomplishment for me. So when I was a kid, I played a decent amount of RT, RTS games, nothing crazy. When I moved to Canada, I lived in my cousin's basement. I started uh, in basement. I started playing StarCraft One, and I started playing. I was like eight years old. I was playing StarCraft One online, playing most of like the mini games in StarCraft One. There was this little game where everyone would get a, a square, and the units would go across the screen, and you'd have to make sure there's no leaks. If there's leaks, you start losing units or whatever. And I just fell in love with the RTS genre in general. I loved it so much. I played AOE on, you know. I made an AOE video on my other channel. I'll leave that like in the top right of this one, which talks about my love for AOE and why I think it's one of the best video games ever made. Um, but I fell in love with the RTS genre. I was playing AOE on like Game Ranger and AOE was fun, but mechanically it was just not good enough until it got to the D edition. In my opinion, AOE was not really playable. Like it was only fun for like LAN parties and when you played with friends, but like competitively, it was so sluggish. It was so outdated. The moment StarCraft 2 came out, I was like, holy shit. This was graphically amazing. The the controls, the the hotkeys, all that stuff. It was so it was so well balanced and created. And I was just I just fell in love with, with StarCraft. I started playing it literally, I would say four hours, five hours a day, every day. Like I was obsessed with StarCraft. I even played in the tournament for money at one point. It was like, I don't know, it was like a hundred dollar tournament. And I got to the finals and I just got absolutely crushed because although I got good at StarCraft, mechanically I was not nowhere near the level where I where I where my ranking kind of is. Um, my macro in late game was horrendous. I was extremely good in the early game. I also knew a lot of really cheesy builds, let's say. I was dangerous in 
Protoss versus Protoss, I would have probably like a 75% win rate because in Protoss versus Protoss, there was one strategy at that level you can do. And if they haven't seen it or if they don't know how to react to it, you're going to win almost every time or whatever, 75% of the time. And that carried my rankings very much. I was okay in late game uh, Protoss versus uh, Zerg, or I think Zerg, yeah. And my Terran versus uh, Protoss was horrendous. I was a Protoss player, and as the game got longer and, you know, it started requiring more micro, more macro, that's when I really slipped. My early game was amazing. My late game was abysmal. Like, I could not keep up with the actual guys that were... They There was guys that got to this level the right way, let's say. They worked on their mechanics, whereas I kind of just figure out what's the best way to win and winning comes at a price you always you, you know you think oh i'm winning all these games this is amazing right but if you're sacrificing the let's say the fundamentals the the pure mechanics of the game at a certain point at the higher levels you get exposed when you don't have those and i wish i knew what i knew today on how to actually play these games competitively how to actually methodically let's say get better at a game how to improve and how to worry about improving in the game as opposed to worrying about getting results but ultimately to try to be competitive in starcraft is unbelievably difficult it is statistically staggering for some random person like me from like Canada, like North America to become a well-paid, let's say Starcraft two player streamer, content creator, what do you want to call it? And the Korean d dudes that play like eight hours a day, live in a house with other world-class players. They are so far ahead of the curve that it honestly was for the best. that so this is where I peaked. And I just said like, okay, this is pretty good. I, I need to like, <laughs> I am, I'm extremely competitive. I have a real problem with trying to put something down before I become, you know, masterful in it. But this for me, I was more than delighted with these results and I was happy with what I accomplished. I think if I really wanted to put my mind to any one thing, I can succeed in it. Um, whether I can get to like top 1000, top 100 level, that's a different story, but I know I can succeed in it if I really wanted to, but I was more than happy with how far I got with StarCraft. All right, I've rambled for about an hour. I hope you found this interesting. If it tanks, it tanks. It is what it is. Um, yeah, I'm continuing to work on new guests, so stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, I don't really know how to end this episode, this listen, but if you enjoyed it, let me know, obviously, and maybe some point down the road, I'll do more of these. All right, peace.